Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, good morning for uh, participants joining us from the US and good evening to participants coming from Australia. Uh, we're uh, into the third session of this exciting day, a second day of really in very rich uh, program that uh, really uh, spiking a lot of in uh, uh, state of the art uh, management of newborns. Uh, as usual, we uh, conclude every day with the most eminent speakers uh, in our program. And it's my pleasure and honor to introduce the speakers of uh, this last session of today, uh, starting with uh, Professor uh, Richard Poland. The, Professor Poland uh, was introduced by my uh, partner, Dr. Junaid, yesterday. Uh, he really doesn't need any introduction as he's well-known international figure in uh, neonatology. Uh, as you know, Professor Richard Pollan, uh, is professor of pediatrics at Columbia University, and uh, he, is the he was the director of the Division of Neonatology at Morgan Stanley Children's Hospital, New York, Presbyterian, uh, until recently. Uh, professor Pollan uh, has published uh, over 200 uh, original reports, 20 books, including the famous uh, book of fetal and neonatal physiology uh, and workbook in practical neonatology and pediatric secrets. Uh, he is the chair of the NICHD, Neonatal Research Network, and uh, uh, ex uh, executive uh, steering committee. Uh, he is uh, also past chair of the sub-board of neonatal financial medicine. It's my honor to introduce Dr. Poland, who's gonna continue the theme of uh, uh, how to uh, uh, manage babies with suspected infections. So his topic will be healthcare associated infection in ITU lessons forgotten and relearned. Uh, welcome, Professor Paul. Push and holding slide. Okay. Good night for some people uh, in Australia. So uh, it's a pleasure for me to be speaking at uh, this conference, which is centered in Abu Dhabi. Uh, I'm sorry we cannot do it in person, but uh, hopefully in the future we will be able to do that. So yesterday I spoke about early onset sepsis. And as you know, these are usually or frequently very sick babies. They have dramatic presentations often re requiring high degrees of, res of uh, respiratory and cardiovascular support, uh, with a mortality rate in term babies probably about 1%. Now, healthcare-associated infections, though, are of a magnitude more importance because they are 10 to 100 times more common uh, than early on sepsis in babies, and they, too, can be associated with adverse outcomes, both increased morbidity and mortality. I enjoy giving this lecture because it gives me an opportunity to talk a little bit about history and for one of my heroes um, in medicine, and that is Dr. Ignaz Philip Semmelweis, who you can see lived in the 1800s. So Dr. Semmelweis was not a neonatologist or an infectious disease expert. He was an obstetrician and he was working in the uh, main uh, obstetrical hospital in Vienna. He actually grew up in Budapest, but had moved to Vienna for some of his training. And when he got there in the 1840s, sort of where this arrow is in the screen, he looked at the mortality rate of women in childbirth, uh, which was between five and 10%, and compared it to a hospital in Dublin where it was uh, less than 2% and, and became frightened. And I just wanna point out on the screen go back one slide, that the rise in the mortality in, in uh, Vienna occurred about here. And that was the beginning of anatomical pathology in Vienna. Before that, they had not had a department of anatomical pathology. And why was that important? Because when someone died, 
everybody would go to the autopsy room and perform an autopsy. As you can see in this picture here, none of the individuals would be wearing gloves. So they would do the autopsy, obviously dry their hands off, and then go up to the obstetrical ward and uh, examine women in childbirth. So um, let me get rid of this. So Semmelweis said, said to himself, I wonder if there's a connection between what happens in the autopsy room and the women who are dying in, in childbirth. And then something else happened. They separated the women who were being cared for by midwives and the mortality rate in those women went down dramatically, shown in the blue line on the slide, and the mortality rate of women cared for by doctors went up. The difference is that midwives never went to the autopsy room. They didn't believe in practical instruction for women, and therefore their mortality, the, the mortality of those women went down, while the mortality of uh, the doctors again went up. And finally, someone said to himself, not knowing about bacteria or germs, said there's something that must be transmitted from those women in autopsy. And what did he do? He made everybody soak, soak their hands in a chlorinated lime solution uh, before they did pelvic examination of women in childbirth. And the mortality rate, as you can see here, and this is actually is from uh, Semmelweis's diary. Uh, you can see when the chlorine hand wash was introduced, went down dramatically. And uh, Semmelweis wrote a very famous monograph called The Etiology and Understanding and Prevention of Childbed Fever, which is called, the, called these purple infections. And unfortunately is rebuffed uh, across the medical community uh, and Semmelweis uh, then moved to Budapest, back to Budapest, he was born in Budapest, and people basically thought he was crazy, and he had some psychological disorders, and he died at the age of 47. Uh, he died in an asylum, and back in those days, he used to try to beat the bad spirits out of you, and he died from a combination of trauma and from infection obviously a very significant individual medical history. And in Vienna, when you go, in Budapest, when you go there, you can see Semmelweis University. So here's my outline for this morning for the next 30 minutes. Identification of risk factors, which result in healthcare associated infections and how we can avoid them. Then we're gonna speak specifically about CLAPSIs, central line associated bloodstream infections, the issue of predictive monitoring and try to give you some uh, brief conclusions. So why do we worry about these uh, healthcare associated infections? And I say it's the three M's, money, mortality, and mental deficiency. And these numbers are a little bit old now, but in the US, as of about eight or nine years ago, there were more than 100,000 deaths secondary to healthcare associated infections, both in adults and children. And the estimate back then was six and a half billion dollars. I would bet it's close to uh, a trillion dollars now, and clearly it is worldwide. Now, the Center for Medicare Medicaid Services, which reimburses hospital for expenses, will not reimburse a hospital where there's a catheter-associated bloodstream infection. They consider those never events. It's like falling out of bed. An individual should not have one of those infections. Data from the neonatal research network says it's close to half of all deaths beyond two weeks of age or due to infectious complications. We all know that healthcare associated infections are associated with poor neurodevelopmental outcomes. And I'll show you those data in a second. And they're unfortunately too common. So here we have data from two different databases, the National Healthcare Safety Network, which is uh, a consortium of hospitals in the US. As uh, those are shown in this slide, in these numbers going down, the black numbers going down, uh, on, in parentheses are data from the International Nosocomial Infection Control Consortium, which are data from across the world. And on the left here, you see babies of different uh, birth weights, less than 750 to 2,500 grams. And as you might imagine, looking at the data from the US, the numbers go down as babies get bigger. That makes sense. Smaller babies uh, have an increased susceptibility to infection and are often more critically ill. But if you look at the international data, it's a little surprising to me. The numbers don't go down at all where you'd expect them. They sort of go up and down and don't change significantly from that weight group, less than 750 up to 2,500 grams. And it says to me 
that some of the problem, but not all the problem internationally may have to do with hand hygiene. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. This is the best study I've looked at uh, in terms of economics. It's a few years old now, but it looked at the cost of intensive care um, in babies who have an infection, which is shown in yellow on this graph versus babies who do not have an infection. And they broke it down to different birth weight groups. You can see that at the bottom on the x-axis at the bottom. And we see two sets of bars. One set of bars is observed and the second set of bars is adjusted for confounding variables. And at almost every birth weight category, babies with infection have a higher mean cost. The actual numbers, if you look at the right part of the slide, uh, again, broken down to different birth weight uh, categories is shown here. So at each birth weight grouping, the difference is about $30,000. So babies with nosocomial infection, which is what they called healthcare associated infections, was about $30,000 more than babies who did not have such an infection. And it also varied by the kind of pathogen. So down over here, we have no nosocomial infection with a mean cost of about $50,000. Here's coagulative negative staphylococcus, an increase in the, uh, for that pathogen, uh, about $50,000. Other bacteria, gram positive, gram negative, a little bit higher, and fungi being the most expensive. And these are data from Barbara Stolen from the uh, Neonatal Research Network published a number of years ago, but it's since been replicated in other publications looking at the outcomes of ELBW babies who are infected. And the four outcomes we're looking at are mental developmental index less than 70, psychomotor development index less than 70, cerebral palsy and microcephaly. And almost everything you see in the slide, in fact, I've colored it differently in blue, is significantly different for babies with infection. So all of these outcomes, whether it be poor development, cerebral palsy, or microcephaly, is more common in babies who have a healthcare associated infection. Now I'm gonna just uh, change topics and talk specifically about CLABSIs, central line associated bloodstream infections. And these are five different articles looking at the pathogens responsible for central line associated bloodstream infections. And in fact, they're pretty similar to one another. They're from across the world, US and Europe and the Middle East. And you can see here that for most of these studies, coagulase negative staphylococci are by far the most common cause of central line infections. This last study, which I'm gonna talk about in detail is from Yale and it, it is different because it's less of a cause. Second, followed by coagulase negative staphylococcus are gram negatives. Staphylococcus aureus, and finally fungi and enteric groups. Let's look at this publication from Yale, which was published uh, a couple of years ago. So they broke it down to three different time periods, 89 through 2003, 2004 to 2009, and then most recently, 2010 to 2013. And you see coagulase negative staphylococcus, pretty common, but in this final epoch, it was only 3%. And during that time, Staphylococcus aureus and gram negatives became much more prominent. So what happened in this last epoch? Here it is graphically. Here is where they um, showed a start, a marked decrease in infections due to coagulase negative Staphylococcus. And what the, happened at, at that time was they instituted prevention bundles for these kinds of infections, which I will talk about in some detail in a moment, but they stopped doing central line blood cultures. Now you're gonna hear me say that whenever possible, try to get two blood cultures in the baby, but one of them probably should not be a central line infection because lines become colonized pretty easily. And just because you recover an organism from a line does not mean a baby's infected. So my approach to interpreting blood cultures for coagulase negative staphylococcus in a symptomatic baby I try when it's possible, not always possible, to draw two peripheral blood cultures and then begin broad spectrum antibiotics. I'll talk about treatment in a moment. And then I look what I what, look at the results of those cultures. If both cultures are negative for coagulase negative staphylococcus, obviously there's no sepsis. If one culture is positive and the other is negative, I call that a contaminant. If both cultures are positive, then that's 
coagulates, uh, coagulates native staphylococcobacteremia, but I do not draw a blood culture from a central line. This is a, a list of the risk factors for central line associated bloodstream infections based on a number of publications from around the world. And they're pretty similar in that the strongest risk factor is um, birth weight and gestation. The tiniest babies, ELBW babies or micropremies have the highest risk of infection. Pretty obviously they have the most problems with their immune system. They also have the most invasive monitoring and are at the greatest risk of a healthcare associated infection. So parental alimentation, central lines, obvious risk factors, Lipid is, is thought to be an independent risk factor for infection. Steroids for BPD, um, used less frequently now, but a risk factor. Histamine blockers, proton pump inhibitors are both associated with healthcare associated infections and even NEC. From a research viewpoint, low serum IgG levels at the time of birth uh, predict a baby who's at higher risk to uh, develop a nosocomial infection. Unfortunately, I'm not gonna talk about it, giving IgG to babies has not been shown to decrease uh, the risk of a healthcare associated infection by more than a few percentage points. Sicker babies, prolonged duration of mechanical ventilation, overcrowding in a NICU, heavy workloads for the staff and nurses and doctors. And it's also in some studies, staffing problems in inexperienced nurses but I would tell you the problem is not, or may not reside with nurses. This is a survey study from the United Kingdom of about 85 NICUs uh, throughout the UK. And they looked at nosocomial bacteremia, which is shown on the y-axis uh, shown over here. And looked at three outcomes, excuse me. Uh, they looked at patient volume, consultant availability and nursing provision. So in units with high patient volume shown on the left side of this slide, there were more infections that probably took care of sicker babies. The number of nurses present, nursing provision did not determine the rates of nosocomial bacteremia, but the number of consultants shown in the middle set of two bars over here uh, was higher when there was a lot of bacteremia, nosocomial bacteremia, uh, and lower numbers of consultants where there was less nosocomial bacteremia and I interpret this that the doctors have a hard time washing their hands using good hand hygiene on a regular basis. So if we're gonna prevent these infections, we have to have a case definition for a TLAPSI. And this is from the World Health and CDC that you need a recognized pathogen uh, in at least one or more blood culture bottles not related to infection at another site. So if someone has an abscess on their arm or leg and develops a bacteremia, that's not a TLAPSI. Or you can have a common skin contaminant like coagulates negative staphylococcus, but there you need at least two positive blood cultures, again, not related to infection at another site. And there's often associated signs and symptoms, fever or hypothermia, apnea, bradycardia, or in severe infections, hypotension. Now, we use the World Health Organization recommendations for hand hygiene, and as I travel around the world, I see this picture in most NICUs. They describe the importance of hand hygiene and when to do it. So if you look at number one, before touching the patient, that's pretty obvious. Before doing a, a sterile procedure, after touching the patient, uh, after a body fluid exposure, all of those are sort of uh, obvious. But if you look at number five on this slide, after touching the patient's surroundings, that's the one we tend to forget most. So when I make rounds in our NICU in New York, and we, we've been walking around for two hours, invariably somebody, one of the residents, leans their hand on the isolate or the counter. And when I see that, I usually stop around and say, please use hand hygiene. We forget that whatever is colonizing the baby is also in the environment. And it's important that if you touch any environmental area that you have all those individuals uh, use good hand hygiene. Why do we use hand hygiene? Because it's effective in getting rid of the bacteria which cause these kinds of infections. So at the bottom of the slide, you see a little cartoon. You see uh, bacteria, some of them living in little tents uh, in the skin, and then you see some riding a bicycle. 
The resident bacteria are deep within the skin and hand hygiene techniques probably don't get rid of most of those resident bacteria. But the transient bacteria sit very superficially and it's those bacteria that are, that are cause most healthcare associated infections and using a hand hygiene technique that degerms. One of the uh, combinations of alcohol plus an emollient are very effective in eradicating those transient flora. And here's the recommendations from the CDC and World Health Organization. And I put on, for some of them, the strength of the recommendation with 1A being the highest and three being the lowest. So one is using, using an alcohol-based hand rub for de decontaminating hands, getting rid of the transient bacteria. If the hands are visibly dirty or contaminated with a, a body secretion, a body fluid or blood, then you have to use soap and water. And I put on the slide, I prefer using a non-antimicrobial soap and water rather than an antimicrobial soap and water. We try to avoid these and try to avoid uh, bacterial resistance. So we just use plain old soap and water if our hands are dirty. We try not to use soaps and detergents that are strongly anionic or cationic because they cause redness of the hands. And I know when I used to come in uh, a few years ago and I examined 30 babies in the NICU, by the end of that 30 babies, my hand would be red and uh, hurting. And it's those kinds of detergents which damage the skin. And remember, damaged skin harbors more pathogens. Brushes that are no longer recommended, even though surgeons still use them, that's a 1B recommendation. Do not use artificial nails or extenders. Uh, we had an epidemic in my NICU, which we published in the Journal of Medicine several years ago. And it started with a nurse who was colonized with pseudomonas underneath her uh, artificial nails. And when those were finally removed, the epidemic ended. And they also say, keep natural hair short, makes sense. No dark nail polishes, because you can't tell extenders if you're using dark nail polishes and clear nail polishes is acceptable. The time to wear gloves is when you're gonna come in contact with blood or any other infectious material um, from mucous membranes or non-intact skin. We try to have the hand washing um, uh, facilities at every bedside so we don't have to start searching around. Uh, for a way to de-germ. And importantly, and I'm sure many of you do this, we, wa we watch closely the practices of our healthcare workers. And who does that? They're usually medical students who need uh, a few dollars and they sit in the NICU, especially in the morning. And when I go there to examine a baby, they have a little checklist and they fill it out and they make sure that I use good hand hygiene before and after examining the baby. And if anybody doesn't, whether it be a chief of surgery or a nurse or some other person working in the NICU, a report is sent out uh, to me, and then I can contact that individual about improving their hand hygiene. But the, just knowing that there's a secret observer in the nursery help, has helped improve our compliance rate with hand hygiene. And this is our bundle. I talked about bundles, groups of interventions, which have proven effective for decreasing collapsy. And very briefly, Hand hygiene, most importantly, um, when you're inserting a catheter, we use sterile gloves and a sterile barrier. We use chloroprep, a combination of chlorhexidine plus alcohol for skin antisepsis whenever we put in central lines, except for umbilical catheters. We try to choose a catheter slight site selection in the upper extremities, although I'm not sure that it makes a big difference. And this is important, we, we review uh, every day, is that line necessary? Can we get it out as soon as possible? And whenever we access the lines, obviously hand hygiene, uh, before and after access, maintaining aseptic technique. We date our tubing in case it needs to be changed. And importantly, we scrub the hub with chlorhexidine or alcohol for 15 seconds. Why do we do that? We do it because when there are indwelling lines on babies that are maintained for a extended period of time, the infection does not occur external to the catheter. The infection comes through contamination, which goes into internal to the catheter and into the bloodstream. Therefore, decontaminating this area here has helped decrease uh, the rate of healthcare associated collapses. Do they work? 
The answer is yes. Uh, nowadays, if we have one clapsy in our NICU, and we have a very high complexity uh, NICU with lots of sick babies, it's always a, a, a source of consternation. We try to have every month go by without a clapsy infection. We're not always perfect, but most uh, months that is true. So how do you manage them? Well, one, if you don't, if there's a infection due to Staphylococcus aureus, you try to get the line out pretty quickly. In fact, if there's any positive blood culture, uh, we try to get the line it, unless it is mandatory, unless it is absolutely essential to the baby's well-being. For fungus, it's mandatory. Always move the line. For Staphylococcus aureus, it's usually mandatory. Again, if it's vital to the infant's well-being, you can give antibiotics through the central line. But again not for those two kinds of pathogens. Coagulase negative staphylococcus can be treated with a central line in place. And remember, if you have a central line blood culture positive for coagulase negative staphylococcus, that often re represents colonization and not infection. And how about treatment? When CLAPS is suspected, there are two choices. The one we prefer to use at Columbia now in many centers across the country is oxacillin and genomycin. This combination, vancomycin, is probably acceptable, except we try to avoid vancomycin use and, and, and decrease the likelihood of a vancomycin-resistant pathogen. And starting with oxacillin and then switching to vancomycin does not increase mortality. Once you have a pathogen identified and its sensitivities, obviously, we're gonna narrow the uh, coverage, antibiotic coverage, we treat coagulase negative staphylococcus for about seven days, uh, making sure that bacteremia has ended once we start antibiotics. Staphylococcus aureus for 14 days and gram negatives for seven to 10 days. And in conclusion about CLAPSI, avoid care practices which bypass skin barrier defense mechanism. That can be as simple as heel sticks or umbilical catheters and central lines. Try not to use drugs which are associated with these kinds of infections, steroids for BPD, uh, histamine blockers or proton pump inhibitors. When you have a baby who's colonized with a resistant or an invasive microorganism, use gown and gloves, limit the use of antibiotics, and when needed, use the simplest and most appropriate drug, and that's why we use oxacillin instead of vancomycin. We use the alcohol-based emollients at every bedside. It does improve compliance. Try to avoid your own skin damage uh, by scrubbing your hand with brushes, brushes or avoiding scrubbing your hand with brushes, breast milk feedings, minimize central venous catheter days, and use sterile batteries for central line insertion and line maintenance. And now I'm going to end by talking about um, how you diagnose these infections. Obviously, at the top of this list is physical examination. And when you're concerned, you get a blood culture. Urine culture, usually because these are late onset infections. CSF culture, not routinely, unless the baby is not responding to usual antibiotic therapy where there's a positive blood culture. And then we get laboratory testing, not uncommonly white count and differential count or acute phase reactants, C-reactive protein or procalcitonin. Now for many years, interleukins, cytokines have been thought about as a good way to diagnose infection and this is one of many articles published a number of years ago looking at interleukin-6 in babies with proven sepsis, those with clinical sepsis and controls. And it goes up very quickly and comes down very quickly. In proven sepsis, the same is true for clinical sepsis, and the numbers are significantly higher than controls. But there's always been a question about how good a marker is it before babies become infected. And in 1998, um, Georg Simbroder and Helmut Kuster from Munich did this really neat study where they followed babies sequentially and measured a number of acute phase reactants and cytokines. And on this slide here, uh, in the uh, orange is C-reactive protein, which you see goes up on the, basically on the day of infection or shortly before the, the day of infection. And then there are two cytokines, interleukin-1 receptor antagonists and IL-6, which rise several days before cytokines are present, which should be before infection is present. Well, you say to yourself, well, it's pretty hard to measure cytokines. Is there a simpler way? And there is a simpler way. 
and that has to do with predictive monitoring and monitoring of vital signs. Now, most of the vital signs we measure in the NICU, heart rate, respiratory rate, saturation, and blood pressure are pretty nonspecific. We look at them. If there's an acute event, we intervene, but they're late markers or relatively late markers of cardiac pulmonary compromise. But there's a growing interest in using the waveforms and the correlations between the waveforms in a way to predict cytokinemia or predict a baby is going to have an adverse event. I'm sure you know this, but organs in the body talk to one another all the time. And that's through anatomic means, neural or endocrine channels. In healthy individuals and in healthy babies, this results in variability of heart rate, breathing, breathing, blood pressure, oxygen saturation, temperature. And there's no relationship that we can see between those values. So it all looks pretty chaotic to us. But in a stressful situation, variability in organ system readout decreases. So we call that decomplexification. And the decrease in variability in various organs signals a pathological process and may represent an opportunity for early detection. So the most well-studied way to identify babies with sepsis is by looking at heart rate variability. It's the HERO monitor. The HERO monitor focuses on heart rate variability and uses these three variables. Looks at the standard deviation of heart rate, um, the irregularity of heart rate, and looks for decelerations because it's known that when there is an infection, signals are carried back to the brain and then the brain in turn sends out other signals to the heart and elsewhere in the body which can either e increase or decrease heart rate and decrease probability. So using heart rate variability or the HERO score, it's a way of predicting when a baby is likely to have a serious or life-threatening infection. This is what the HERO mantra looks like in a healthy uh, baby. So the HERO score, it's a number, not more, not more than anything else. And the HERO score score is low here. There is heart rate variability. And here's a baby who is getting, actually had an infection where the HERO score goes up considerably. And if you look at the heart rate, well, you say to yourself, doesn't look so bad to me, but you can see here, there are these brief periods of decelerations, very hard to detect or impossible to detect in, in the NICU, but using the HERO monitor, they're easy to detect through the algorithm. And it's used as an early detection system for sick babies. And recently we've worked on a new um, way of looking at early detection. That's the cross correlation of heart rate and saturation. We've done that in collaboration with um, our group and, and uh, workers at the University of Virginia. And we've looked at heart rate, saturation and respiratory rate. And remember I said that in a healthy individual, there's no correlation between those physiologic parameters. This is a baby who is, um, nine hours prior to E. coli sepsis or dying from fellow sepsis. And you see the marked correlation in the heart rate, saturation, and breathing pattern. In fact, if you look at the relative risk of late onset sepsis at NEC, where there's not a good correlation in those values, here we're looking at heart rate and saturation, the cross correlation, the risk of sepsis is very low, it's one or less. And when there is a good correlation in the next 24 hours, the risk of uh, sepsis or NEC goes up to greater than three. So in summary, healthcare associated infections are an immense problem. I know that it's true in about every NICU I've ever visited. They increase mortality and morbidity, add trillions of dollars to the cost worldwide. And I'm gonna say that almost all plapsy infections can be prevented by using the bundle. Um, I, we still have them, uh, but I think most can be prevented. And I think that the future are predictive algorithms and continuous monitoring of physiologic variables, which are going to provide an early warning for babies who are having a flapsy event. Again, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you today.
really great uh, lecture. Uh, it's my pleasure now to introduce the second speaker of this session, uh, Dr. Eric Eichenwald. Uh, he's uh, um, joined us before in a previous uh, conferences, uh, and we welcome him back even virtually. Uh, hopefully in the future, we'll have him back personally. Uh, Dr. Eichenwald, he's currently a chief of neonatology at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Uh, he has uh, finished his residency and fellowship in Boston Children's Hospital in, Philadelphia, in, in Boston. Um, and he has many research interests, including respiratory control of preterm infants. Uh, also, he has uh, a lot of uh, trials involved in the uh, quality improvement on neonatal perinatal medicine. He is a member of many uh, medical society, among them pediatric medical society, subboard of the prenatal medicine, American Board of Pediatrics, uh, AAP, Neonatal Resuscitation Program Steering Committee, and Committee on Fetus and Newborn. Uh, so we will stay in a the theme of uh, improving quality of our care to neonates. And uh, Dr. Eric will uh, um, um, present to us on ways to reduce antibiotic use uh, or exposure on a neonate, evidence-based practice. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Eric, and uh, it's all yours. Greetings, everyone uh, in the, the UAE. I, I miss seeing my friends in um, in Abu Dhabi and in um, uh, the, the UAE, but um, I'm happy to be here to speak to this conference again. It's always been a great conference, and thanks to Dr. Amen and Dr. Janae in particular. Um, so I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. So today, I think this is an a excellent uh, bookend to Dr. Poland's uh, talk yesterday and his talk today about um, early onset infections yesterday and late onset infections uh, today, um, because what I'm going to talk about is really the opposite, is how to avoid overusing antibiotics in the NICU, which is a major problem um, across the world. And so the learning objectives for today is really the opposite of what uh, Dr. Poland spoke about, which is to identify which preterm infants may be at the lowest risk of early onset sepsis. And then I'm going to talk a bit about the reliability of blood culture techniques to diagnose uh, true bacteremia, because we do, um, in most NICUs, treat a lot of what we call clinical sepsis. And then we'll identify some strategies to limit antibiotic exposure in the NICU. So I think Dr. Poland mentioned uh, these statements from the Committee on Fetus and Newborn in the United States uh, yesterday, uh, particularly the one about um, management of neonates born at greater than equal to 35 weeks. And, and I'm not going to talk today about um, bigger babies. I'm really going to concentrate on the management of babies that are born preterm and particularly extremely preterm in our NICUs. So one of the things to recognize is that, um, as Dr. Poland mentioned in his talk, is that while early onset sepsis is a major problem, and you can see this is showing the number of infection episodes in one unit, you can see that, that across the spectrum of ages that we take, take care of babies in our NICU, even though the overall number of episodes each day is low, you can see that in total, Babies over the first month of life um, have uh, a, a very significant risk of late onset sepsis, whereas early onset sepsis um, is, a, is a major problem, particularly in the, in the smaller birth weight babies. So I'm just gonna start with uh, a uh, really an invented case, uh, just to set the stage for what we're gonna talk about for the next half hour. And I think that this is the type of incident that happens in our NICUs every day of the week. 
So it's 3 a.m. and the tiny infant is on mechanical ventilation and receiving parenteral nutrition via a central catheter. So you're called to the bedside because she is requiring more oxygen, her abdomen is distended, and her C-reactive protein is elevated. So you increase the ventilator support, stop her feedings, draw blood cultures, and begin therapy with broad spectrum antibiotics. Two mornings later, about 48 hours, the blood culture is sterile, but the infant is better. And the team asks you how long you want to continue antibiotic therapy. And you grumble to yourself about those unreliable neonatal blood cultures because the baby was sick and now it's better on the antibiotics. And so you go ahead and order a 10 day course of empiric broad spectrum antibiotics. And I think in the past, most of us thought, sorry, most, most of us thought that, you know, after all, what can be the harm of continuing antibiotics? They're relatively safe in individual babies and you just want to keep this specific baby safe. So we're gonna talk quite a lot in the next several minutes about whether that statement is true. So antibiotic exposure in the NICU is, is one of the most common medication exposures uh, that we see, particularly in the very low birth weight infant. So treatment of culture-confirmed bacterial infection, as Dr. Pol Polin was mentioning in his talk, uh, in his talks, is of course of obvious benefit. But it's very common practice to administer antibiotics to preterm infants in the absence of culture confirmed infection. And I think that this is based on three assumptions that many neonatologists have. The first is that blood cultures are not always reliable because if we had 100% confidence in the reliability of blood culture to grow an organism if it was present in the blood, then we would always stop antibiotics when cultures were sterile. And we worry about false negatives due to prior antibiotic expo exposure, particularly in the setting of early onset sepsis where the mother may have received antibiotics for chorioamnionitis. And we worry that that might make the baby's blood culture sterile, even if there, are, um, if there is bacteremia. And we also worry that there could be false negatives in the light of critical illness. Now that goes with both early onset sepsis as well as the risk of late onset sepsis. When a baby is critically ill, we may not believe the, the blood culture when it comes back sterile. And we also have another assumption is that the risks associated with antibiotic use is predictable and manageable. We worry about drug toxicities to the individual infant. Obviously there's a need for IV access, um, but we, worry less about those drug toxicities and the, some of the drugs we use because we monitor levels. And we don't think that the individual baby being exposed to antibiotics is going to be a problem. And the third assumption I think we make is that antibiotic use, even in the absence of a known organism has significant benefits to the individual infant. And that's the treatment of culture negative sepsis. Because if we didn't think that continuing antibiotics in the face of sterile blood cultures was not beneficial to the baby, clearly we wouldn't be doing that practice. And so I'm gonna now talk about early onset sepsis risk and antibiotic administration in preterm infants. And the theme here is going to be again and again, the use of antibiotics in the setting of negative blood cultures. And early onset sepsis is important because approximately 80% of antibiotic initiation in the NICU occurs in the first 72 hours after birth. So many babies are treated and many babies, as I'll show you in a moment, are treated for prolonged periods of time. So this is a study that um, looked at, at um, um, many hospitals across the country that was uh, first authored by Dustin Flannery, one of our faculty here at CHOP. And this just simply shows you the variation in duration of early antibiotic exposures across different NICUs, and these are in the United States. And pretty much every practice that goes on in NICUs across the country, ventilation strategies, use of different types of medications, you'll see the same sort of graphics, which is that there are uh, low users and high users but this degree of variation, this is um, percentage of ELBW infants receiving antibiotics for more than five days 
and you can see it, it goes from about maybe 5% in one NICU to upwards to 80%, 90% in another NICU. And this sort of variation, I think, tells you that practice style is influencing the use of antibiotics, not so much the rate of early onset sepsis. And this was, I think, demonstrated in a study by Rachel Greenberg down at Duke, uh, looking at um, uh, centers in the neonatal research network in the United States. And this looked at variation in early prolonged, which was defined as greater than or equal to five days of antibiotic exposure in infants less than 1,000 grams. And on the bottom here is the, is the actual percent of early onset sepsis. And you can see there's not enormous variation here, but there's pretty significant variation um, amongst the different sites. And these are all academic NICUs across the United States. This is a mistake in the graph. This should be 30%. So it ranges from 30% to as high as almost 70% of babies being exposed to prolonged antibiotics. And you can see here, these three centers with the highest rate of antibiotic, prolonged antibiotic exposure. These NICUs have a higher rate of, of early onset sepsis, but here, this center has the lowest rate of culture confirmed early onset sepsis, but has one of the highest rates of prolonged antibiotic exposure. And so our practices are to expose um, lots of babies to prolonged antibiotics um, in the absence of culture-confirmed infection, which again is due to some of those assumptions that I presented earlier. So I think the important question is, is prolonged antibiotic therapy in unaffected VLBW infants truly harmless? And this was a publication from the Canadian Research Network that looked at the antibiotic use rate, which is a way of normalizing, given the number of patients in patient days, how frequently antibiotics are used um, in an individual NICU. And you can see here that the estimated probability of mortality increased as the antibiotic use rate increased. And higher antibiotic use rate, or the AUR, was associated with higher morbidity and mortality. And I think that this is confounded by indication, obviously, because the sickest babies are at risk for um, uh, death and morbidity, but they're also at risk for having prolonged antibiotic use. And it's very unusual in our NICUs for a baby to die without being exposed to antibiotics. But it brings up the question, is there a risk of dysbiosis or a change in the microbiome in these babies by prolonged antibiotic exposure. And that seems to be the case. Then when you look at the microbiome of babies who've been exposed to antibiotics uh, early, that it changes the microbiome to, towards more um, pathogenic bacteria. And while I'm not gonna talk about that in any detail, I think that there's lots of literature now about how there is a dysbiosis um, or, a, mal or a, a malfunction of what the normal colonization of, of the baby's um, intestine should look like um, with antibiotic exposure. And so I think that this study makes you pause to say, could there really be a harm in using antibiotics for a prolonged period of time in the uninfected infant? This is another study uh, that, that attempted to um, uh, take into account the early antibiotic exposure by correcting for severity of illness. And what they found was that each day of antibiotic exposure was associated with a 24% higher risk of death, late onset sepsis, or necrotizing enterocolitis. And again, even though this corrected for uh, severity of illness, it still may be confounded by indication in the fact that sicker babies are gonna get prolonged, more, pro, more likely to get prolonged antibiotics. But I think, again, it, it does suggest that there may be some harm in using antibiotics in babies who are uninfected. So the next obvious question, I think, is to ask, can we identify a group of extremely preterm infants who are at lower risk of early onset sepsis and therefore avoid 
empiric antibiotics. Most of the work, as Dr. Poland mentioned um, in his talk, has been focused on identifying the babies who are at highest risk of infection and knowing which babies to treat with antibiotics. And this is the converse. Can we identify a group of babies who are at the lowest risk of early onset sepsis and perhaps um, not use empiric antibiotics in that situation? So extreme prematurity and the risk of early onset sepsis, we know that premature infants are at high risk of early onset sepsis and are significantly higher risk than term babies. And because of that, most are treated with empiric antibiotics after birth. We know that the pathogenesis of early onset sepsis is primarily through ascending infection from the birth canal into the, um, into, into the uh, uh, amniotic cavity. And so the question that some of my colleagues here asked was that are extremely preterm infants who are delivered for maternal indications cesarean section with membranes intact at delivery, there's no clinical evidence for chorioaminitis at lower risk for early onset sepsis. And I think that that takes into account the biology of most cases of early onset sepsis, which require there to be access to the amniotic cavity to the bacteria um, to be able to cause an ascending infection, chorioaminitis, and therefore infecting the baby. And if you can identify those babies, can they be safely managed without antibiotics after birth, um, even if there's some sign of illness? So my colleague here at CHOP, Karen Popolo, published this a few years ago. This was looking at um, data from, again, from the Neonatal Research Network. And she and her colleagues asked the question, if we did take those babies who were delivered by cesarean section, intact membranes, no sign of, of chorioamnionitis, um, what was their actual risk of, of infection? And these are babies who um, were delivered under different circumstances, rupture of membranes, vaginal delivery, et cetera. And you can see that there's a very significant difference between the, the incidence of early onset sepsis or death at less than 12 hours in the comparison group versus this group that's defined by the delivery circumstances. So the risk of infection is about 2% here and up to 15% in, the, in, this other, in this other group. And in this paper, um, she also looked at antibiotic use in ELBWs who were at low risk for early onset sepsis. And you can see these are the different network centers these are the um, uh, incidents of sepsis and the incidence of prolonged antibiotics. And you can see again, there's, there's um, significant differences between the different sites. This is um, prolonged antibiotics, early onset sepsis, significant differences, but many, many babies are treated. And if you look at the data, the number of infants given prolonged antibiotics per early onset sepsis case for the low risk group was 66 and for the comparison group was 19. So lots of babies receiving antibiotics for a relatively low risk of, of, um, of sepsis. And so I think that may allow us to identify um, uh, babies who are born in our NICUs that may be, may be allowed to not be treated with antibiotics for an empiric period of time after birth. And this is uh, a suggested algorithm for sepsis evaluation in VLBW infants that we use in our birth hospitals here in Philadelphia. And um, uh, if there's uh, obvious signs of chorioamnionitis or there's a part interpartum fever, the babies get ruled out for sepsis. But then we, we stratify by the reason for preterm um, delivery. So if it's for a maternal indication, there's a C-section delivery without labor and rupture and no rupture of membranes at the, and there's rupture of membranes at delivery. If the baby does not require hemodynamic support, so we use signs of shock as a, as a clinical indicator, then we would provide routine care without antibiotics. And if there's induction of labor and a, and a subsequent vaginal or cesarean delivery, if the infant requires respiratory or hemodynamic support, the baby would get ruled out for sepsis. And if not, we again would, would elect not to treat that baby with antibiotics and just monitor very carefully. So 
This takes into account both the mode of delivery as well as the severity of illness after birth. And obviously many babies who are born very preterm may require respiratory support because of lung immaturity or respiratory distress syndrome. And so uh, those babies, when you can't differentiate critical illness from sepsis would get treated with antibiotics. But there is a subpopulation that, that we think is safe to simply monitor without antibiotics after birth. So let's now shift to blood cultures in preterm infants and talk about reliability as well as time to positivity. So blood cultures are obviously a diagnostic standard for the presence of bacteremia. And current blood culture techniques rely on the production of CO2 or change in gas pressure to detect growth. And in most sites, these blood cultures are continuously and automatically assessed and flagged if there's a change in gas pressure to when there's growth in the medium. They're optimized to detect very low levels of bacteremia and most blood culture systems will detect bacteremia at a level as low as one to 10 CFU and a minimum of one ml of blood that's inoculated. And it's also true that culture medium in most modern systems include antimicrobial neutralization elements, which should make us confident that um, exposure to antibiotics in the mother may not um, disallow the, the possibility of blood cultures being positive in the baby. And this is a, 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 a systemic review of um, blood culture time to positivity in neonates. And the important thing here is, I won't go through each study, but the important thing here is in newborns, greater than 90% of cultures become positive by 36 hours of, of, in, in, of inoculation of the blood culture. This here, the study, birth weight less than 1500 grams, you can see that 97.6% of the cultures were positive at 36 to 48 hours. And so pretty much across the board, 36 hours gives you a nine out of 10 that the culture is gonna be positive, you're gonna see it. And this gives us the ability to potentially stop antibiotics earlier by what, what's called a hard stop order set, which can be built into a computerized order entry or into written orders just to, just to institute a stop. And if you do stop antibiotics at 36 hours, for example, um, and the culture does subsequently come back positive, that would give you a very short delay in antibiotic administration if the culture did come back positive later than 36 hours. And this is another example of blood culture time to positivity by organism type. And you can see here that gram negative organisms seen here in the black become, if they're present, become positive very quickly, about 100% of them by 24 hours. Gram positives grow a little bit more slowly, but again, you're hitting 90% positivity by about 36 hours of, of uh, incubation. And so I talked briefly about this effect of an automatic 48 hour stop order or even a 36 hour stop order on the antibiotic utilization rate. And this was a study that, that looked at um, uh, IV antibiotic use in, in a NICU over, um, over time. And you can see when they instituted in their medical record or their order entry system an auto stop order where the antibiotics automatically got stopped at 48 hours if the cultures were negative. You can see that the antibiotic use rate dropped in a significant way um, just simply by adding in that auto stop, which makes it more um, activity on the part of the neonatologist to restart antibiotics. So let's shift and we'll talk about late onset sepsis evaluation in antibiotic administration since that constitutes a greater degree of, of actual sepsis in the babies and also in, is important for antibiotic use. So as Dr. Poland um, pointed out, late onset infections are more common than early onset sepsis in ELBW patients. And preterm infants are frequently started on antibiotics due to nonspecific signs. And in one study of in two different settings, um, looked at why antibiotics were started. You can see that there are very nonspecific. Feeding intolerance was the majority of time looking for necrotizing enterocolitis, increased respiratory support, increased apnea bradycardia, or the baby had an ill appearance. And obviously those can be associated with late onset sepsis, 
But many of those clinical signs are just the natural course of the preterm infant's clinical time in the NICU. And so what this leads to is that many uninfected infants are being exposed to broad spectrum antibiotics since we tend to use much broader spectrum antibiotics in the setting of late onset sepsis than early onset sepsis. Um, bancomycin, um, at least over the course of the last couple of decades, has been one of the most frequently prescribed antibiotics for late onset sepsis in US NICUs. And this is due to the prevalence, as Dr. Poland showed, of coagulase, ne coagulase negative staphylococci and the concern um, in many sites for methicillin resistant staph aureus. Um, vancomycin is frequently combined with broad spectrum antibiotics for gram negative organisms, with some examples down below in red. And again, this leads to many uninfected infants being exposed to broad spectrum therapy. And that may have consequences on the local ecology of antimicrobial resistance and fungal infections. There certainly has been a correlation between use of broad spectrum third generation cephalosporins and the incidence of fungal infections in individual NICUs. So this is um, an example of um, the antibiotic utilization rate across US NICUs. And this is, um, again, looking at the incidence for late onset sepsis, sepsis evaluations. And you can see here, I'll, I'll just point out here that the, 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 um, the black line are regional NICUs. So these are gonna be some of the academic centers across the United States. And you can see that there's a, that there's a fairly broad um, scope of the antibiotic utilization rate across um, different sites in the United States. And I think that that, that um, again, is not correlated with the incidence of late onset sepsis. And so um, what we'd like to see is the antibiotic utilization rate um, dropping um, and narrowing to, um, to when, so we're not treating babies with negative blood cultures for clinical sepsis. Now, one of the things that is important though, and one thing that can be taking, that can uh, be a quality improvement project in your NICU is one of our fellows, uh, uh, Melissa Schmatz, uh, did a study in our CHOP NICU looking at the association of later onset time to antibiotics uh, when a decision was made to treat with antibiotics and the probability of, of, of uh, mortality. And you can see that, um, that the, the quicker the antibiotics were instituted in, this, in the setting of a concern about late onset sepsis, the lower the mortality. And so we've um, had a quality improvement project in our NICU over the last several years to try to reduce the minutes to antibiotic administration when the decision is made to treat with antibiotics. Um, and you can see that we've been successful in decreasing um, the time to antibiotics with our goal being um, 80 to 90% of antibiotics are administered within uh, 60 minutes of the decision to treat and evaluate for late onset sepsis. So Dr. Uh, Poland talked about the importance of hand hygiene and, and I'll, I'll reinforce this. This is that what we call in the United States, mom and apple pie, which is that nobody can argue that hand hygiene is not important. But there have been some studies that have actually looked at what happens with various degrees of hand hygiene compliance. And this is uh, one study that was done in a, in a newborn intensive care unit, looking at the acquisition rate of uh, methicillin resistant staph aureus with the rate of hand hygiene compliance. Because it's thought that Staph aureus, particularly MRSA, is more likely passed to babies through our um, hands when they're not clean. And you can see that there does seem to be, um, this is the rate of hand hygiene compliance here, and this is MRSA colonization rates. And you can see that in the times where there's less hand hygiene, there's more MRSA colonization, and most late onset infections occur through colonizations of the catheters or colonizations of the babies. And so you are unlikely to get bacteremia unless you're colonized with the organism. And another study that also looked at hand hygiene compliance looked at the actual incidence of sepsis. And what they found here is that as hand hygiene compliance dipped, the rate of sepsis in babies less than 1500 grams went up. And so I think this is a direct evidence that how we 
um, manage hand hygiene in our NICUs can have a downstream effect on the incidence of sepsis. And that's a very simple uh, uh, activity that can make us feel more confident and have babies less exposed to antibiotics over time when the sepsis rate is lower. So here's some practice recommendations that, that I've put together for the antibiotic stewardship in the NICU. Um, I think that um, uh, Rich um, mentioned this, but I think that it's important to obtain a minimum of one ml per pediatric blood culture bottle of blood. And um, that should be done routinely uh, because the, the likelihood that you're going to have a false negative blood culture is much lower with a greater inoculum of blood in the uh, blood culture bottle. I would recommend protocols for antibiotic use in infants at low risk for early onset sepsis, such as I showed you in that graphic from our birth hospitals. One could consider an automatic stop rule after 36 to 48 hours of, of blood cultures if blood cultures are negative, meaning that the computer system or the order stops the antibiotics, and I would recommend 36 hours rather than 48 hours given the time to positivity of most blood cultures, and then reassess if the blood culture comes back positive. Um, one should be reviewing at least annually your unit specific isolates to choose the least broad spectrum antibiotics for rule out. And that would include, are you screening for MRSA? So if you're screening for MRSA, then don't use vancomycin, use oxycillin as, as Dr. Poland noted for your initial antibiotics, use a less broad spectrum antibiotic. I think that NICU medical directors and uh, uh, the neonatologist should enforce restriction of prolonged broad spectrum antibiotics for culture negative sepsis. You should have a higher threshold for treating culture negative sepsis than I think we currently do in many NICUs across the world. And lastly, I didn't mention this, but there's some evidence that in very preterm babies, particularly those who receive uh, fresh breast milk, that some um, sepsis-like syndromes can be caused by acquisition um, after birth of cytomegalovirus. And so in many units, if there are uh, situations where you have a sepsis-like syndrome with negative blood cultures, you might think about doing cytomegalovirus testing which could lead you to um, down a pathway of not using um, broad spectrum antibiotics in that situation. And lastly, I think when, when recommendations for when an infant becomes suddenly very ill, it's reasonable to use very broad, broad spectrum coverage, which might improve um, ceftazidine or cefepime, um, um, uh, amphotericin in situations where you have a large um, proportion of late onset sepsis caused by fungus. But when culture results are known, I think you should stop antibiotics where the cultures are negative and make, generate that into your practice and use the narrowest possible choice of antibiotics when cultures are positive. So, so tailor your antibiotics to the sensitivities of the organism that you um, um, get out of your blood culture. And if you do choose to treat for presumed culture negative late onset sepsis, which many of us still do, um, because of the critical illness of the babies. You should try to use the narrowest choice of antibiotics that you possibly can and try to avoid prolonged exposure of, say, to third generation cephalosporins if you have a negative blood culture. So just my final slide, just to show you that, um, um, that antibiotic stewardship really can work. Um, what this shows is over, is over time, Again, very broad um, spectrum use over lots of patients in the antibiotic utilization rate. And as antibiotic stewardship um, uh, activities increased, you can see these, um, uh, the antibiotic utilization rate narrowed. So you, the, it went down significantly in academic regional NICUs. And so I think that this is important that you can make a difference, you can make an impact through antibiotic stewardship and quality improvement work in your NICU. So with that, I will close and uh, thank you for your attention. And I do hope that I'll be able to see my friends and colleagues in the UAE in 2021 or 2022. And please everyone listening, stay safe, stay healthy.
and thank you for listening. Well, for a great presentation, I just have it that we actually all ten years of this conference. Uh, now we reach one uh, bit the attendees uh, watching at this moment uh, for this conference. So uh, great participation, and uh, we hope that uh, everybody benefiting from. Uh, this great presentation by great speakers. Now it's my pleasure and uh, honor to introduce uh, the uh, final speaker for today. We we left the uh, best for last, and uh, Professor Lucas uh, is uh, well known to our region and all around the world. Uh, he's the founder of Child Nutrition Research Center and Institute of Child Health in London. He's emeritus professor at uh, pediatric nutrition, and he also holds an emeritus uh, chair at Oxford University, Cambridge University. He has extensively worked in the field of nutrition from uh, the uh, time of fetal life to adolescence, and he has particular interest in the concept of programming. Uh, he has uh, published over 100, 400 publications in the field of pediatric nutrition, and he received numerous awards for his work, including uh, awards by British Pediatrics and American uh, Academy of Pediatrics uh, for lifetime contribution to nutrition. So uh, we are still continuing on the uh, quality uh, of uh, care that we, prevent, that we present to our babies. And uh, we are glad to, that, that Professor Lucas is uh, joining us to talk about preterm nutrition. Uh, first, do no harm. Welcome, Professor Lucas. I need to disclose that I advise breast milk and formula companies, but my talk today represents a 40 year long area of personal interest. I want to take you back to 2004 to the time made its iconic remark, first do no harm. If we're going to put that in a modern context, I believe that if we do an intervention in order to achieve a clinical benefit, then we have some kind of duty to understand, quantify, and minimize any risks of harm that could come from that intervention. And I want to apply that concept to the use of cow's milk products in the NICU. Uh, these have been immensely important for us and we'll uh, continue uh, to use these, but they've been highly effective in promoting growth, but nevertheless pose a risk of adverse outcomes. And I want to examine that with you today. Now, satisfactory testing for the safety of preterm diets requires logical study designs. If you are looking at the safety of a new drug, your index groups might have different doses of the drug, but by and large, you would want your control group not to be taking the drug um, because that would confound the analysis. And that simple principle has often not been applied to testing the safety of cow's milk products. Babies can be fed partially or entirely on cow's milk, but ideally the comparison group 
should not have been exposed to cow's milk. They should have been fed on an exclusive human milk diet. And there is the problem with the literature because babies are often described as being exclusively human milk fed when cow's milk derived fortifier has been added to the breast milk, providing around 50% of the protein intake. So having large amounts of cow's milk in the human milk reference group and the cow's milk exposed group blunts comparisons, making safety difficult to quantify or even detect at all. <clears throat> if we take this trial by Chandler, he wanted to compare preterm formula with donor milk when mothers didn't produce enough milk. This looks like a nice study design, but the study failed to detect adverse impact of preterm formula, which had been shown over prior decades. And some clue as to why that might have occurred um, is um, derived from looking at the methods section in the paper where you can see that cow's milk derived fortifier has been added to both mother's milk groups and also the donor milk group. So this lack of difference between donor milk and preterm formula was plausibly methodological due to having large amounts of cow's milk in both limbs of the trial. So such flawed studies may potentially lead clinicians and therefore our new approach to studying the safety of cow's milk is to exclude many studies where cow's milk exists in the exclusive human milk comparison group. So what randomized trials provide prolonged 100% human milk comparison group? Well, our historic trials compared donor breast milk with preterm formula as cell diets or as supplements to mother's milk in the pre-45 era. So this was an exclusive human milk diet being randomly compared to exposure to cow's milk. And there are actually eight randomized trials in the pre-45 era of that design. And now we have a generation of modern trials where exclusive human milk is achieved with human milk-based products versus cow's milk exposure and 6,000 subjects in cohort studies that compare the same diets. So my goal in the first part of this lecture is to quantify the impact of cow's milk on these five important outcomes using meta-analyses with those, those of you who have a statistical bent uh, using um, random effects models, uh, which are very conservative in appropriately controlled studies from all over the world. Now I want to start with necrotizing enterocolitis. Here uniquely are the seven randomized trials in the world literature where there's an exclusive human milk comparison diet. And I've set up this forest plot so that anything to the right of this line of no effect represents an adverse effect of cow's milk. You can see the summary diamond is well to the right, representing a significant 2.7 fold increased risk of necrotizing enterocolitis in babies exposed to cow's milk. And importantly, these early trials from the 1980s show exactly the same effect size as the later trials. Now, if we look at neck incidence in these seven randomized trials, 2.3% on an exclusive human milk diet, 6.7% in the cow's milk exposed group, but this depends on how much cow's milk you're exposed to. In those seven trials, we have some that uh, compare exclusive human milk with all cow's milk or with partial cow's milk feeding. And you can see that for the all cow's milk group, there's a 4.6 fold increased risk of NEC, whereas with partial cow's milk feeding, there's still a more than doubling of the risk of developing neck. Proven sepsis, here we have the six randomized trials with an exclusive human milk comparison group showing a significant 1.4 fold, that's 40% increased risk of proven sepsis in babies who receive cow's milk products. For mortality, the earlier studies seldom recorded death, but if we look at the modern trials, there's a 2.5 fold increased risk of death in babies who received a cow's milk product. Severe retinopathy of prematurity, major cause of blindness. You can see here that we have one randomized trial that examines severe ROP in relation to diet. And both groups had 100% human milk based diet. And those who are randomly assigned 
to a cow's milk rather than a human milk derived fortifier had a six-fold increased risk of severe ROP. But to improve the estimation of the effect size, I've included this trial with three cohort studies of the right design. And you can see here a 2.3-fold increased risk in over uh, 2,000 subjects in the group that was exposed to cow's milk. And also a 30% increased risk of bronchopulmonary dysplasia using a mixture of randomized trials and cohort studies in the cow's milk exposed group. So these are our new provisional relative risks of morbidities uh, with cow's milk uh, versus an exclusive human milk diet, uh, greater than we thought. And you can see the biggest effects for neck, death, and retinopathy of prematurity. But these effects are still important. A 40% increase in sepsis is major, bearing in mind how common sepsis is. Now there is a new player in this field, patent ductus arteriosus. In 2016, Hare noted a highly significant increase in PDA with cow's milk exposure versus a modern exclusive human milk diet. And we decided to explore this in our large randomized trials. And our diagnosis of PDA was before the scan era based on clinical signs plus the need for either medical or surgical treatment. And you can see that if we compare donor breast milk as a sole diet or preterm formula as a sole diet, there's a 2.6 fold increased risk in the cow's milk group rather than the exclusive human milk group. And I've assembled all the studies that I can find that have the appropriate design, uh, nearly two and a half thousand subjects, and you can see a 40% increased risk of patent ductus in babies who've been exposed to cow's milk. So the adverse effects of cow's milk pervade neonatology. Now, I want to take you on an adventure into the later effects of early cow's milk exposure, because cow's milk-based products affect later health in really quite diverse ways. One aspect I want to consider is that cow's milk exposure results in poorer feed tolerance, and that is an unexpected pathway to significant later morbidity. The key medical issue here is that worse feed tolerance with cow's milk means a potentially higher duration of hazardous parenteral nutrition. And I want to give you two examples with long-term effects. Parenteral nutrition solutions are heavily contaminated with aluminum. And we wondered whether parenteral aluminum could adversely affect the brain and bones of preterm infants as it did in the past in ren renal dialysis patients. So we did an aluminum trial comparing regular parenteral nutrition with parenteral nutrition with 90% less aluminum. We published this in the New England Journal and essentially, you lose one mental development index point, that's like an IQ point, for each day of standard parenteral nutrition in the NICU. And at 13 to 15 years follow-up, the standard parenteral nutrition group had reduced lumbar and hip, uh, hip bone mass, uh, which are risk factors for later osteoporosis and hip fracture. Now, if you have an increase in parenteral nutrition, you're likely to have an increase in parenteral lipid. And parenteral lipid is dose-related, we found, to arterial stiffness at our 25 to 28-year follow-up. And at that stage, arterial stiffness is highly predictive of an increased risk of major cardiovascular events, notably a heart attack or a stroke. So cow's milk increases the need for parenteral nutrition. That in these examples increases aluminum and parenteral lipid exposure with some rather major uh, adverse long-term outcomes. And it's this indirect effect on cognitive development I want to focus on because there are possible further indirect adverse impacts of cow's milk-based products on neurodevelopment. Cow's milk increases the risk of neck and sepsis, and numerous studies link neck and sepsis to adverse neurodevelopment. Our most recent analysis is submitted for publication based on our 30-year follow-up and shows that infection and neck are associated with lower full-scale IQ and performance IQ at seven and at 30 years follow-up. 
And we've also found that after adjustment for confounding, babies with neck are 3.4 times more likely to develop cerebral palsy. And even those with sepsis are 2.2 times more likely to develop cerebral palsy. Now, cow's milk is also linked to respiratory disease, and there's increasing evidence that respiratory disease may be associated with reduced later IQ. And to show you our own data here, each day of ventilation we found was associated after adjustment with a 4.4 point lower verbal IQ seven to eight years later, and BPD with a five point lower verbal IQ. So the hypothesis I'm developing here with you is that if you expose babies to cow's milk products, there are a number of morbidities that they may have in the neonatal period, each of which is associated with adverse neurodevelopment. And that's only one thread linking cow's milk with the brain. Cow's milk products may provide suboptimal levels of certain brain nutrients, such as sphingomyelin and cholesterol, and also may derange the gut flora, which could theoretically adversely affect the brain through the gut-brain axis. But that is the theory. If that theory is correct, then those babies who are fed on cow's milk should have worse neurodevelopment. That was shown by Amy Hare last year, looking at 250 babies, less than 1250 grams. And what she found was that the cow's milk exposed group had a seven point lower cognitive score compared to an exclusive human milk fed group. That's half a standard deviation loss of cognitive potential in those who are cow's milk exposed. If we look at our historic trials, I'll just give you an example. We have bank breast milk versus preterm formula again, and you can see that the arithmetic score at seven to eight years of age was 21% lower in the preterm formula group, despite the fact that there was a much greater nutrient content of preterm formula versus donor milk. We've been looking at the brain in those fed cow's milk products for some years, and aside the lower cognitive and math scores, we found that at follow-up, um, these babies uh, end up as adults with a smaller brain on MRI and less white matter and myelin in the brain, which is a basis for connectivity. And a couple of years ago, there was an observational study by Cortez uh, showing that brain damage in the form of periventricular leukomalacia uh, was at a higher incidence in those who are fed on a cow's milk derived preterm formula rather than mother's milk. And the same has occurred now in another study um, just this year. Severe PVL or severe IVH were related um, to cow's milk exposure with a much higher incidence than those who are fed on an exclusive human milk diet. So cow's milk may relate to the brain in a number of ways in terms of reduced cognitive scores, reduced um, long-term brain uh, size, reduction in myelinization, and now this new association with severe brain damage. I want to move on to talk about the programming of cardiovascular disease, which is the commonest cause of death in the West. If we look again at our historic trials, comparing an exclusive human milk diet with exposure to cow's milk, you can see that those who are randomly assigned to cow's milk in the newborn period ended up 16 years later with five key risk factors for adult cardiovascular disease, raised blood pressure, LDL cholesterol, insulin resistance, tendency to fatness, and an inflammatory marker. And these effects were not minor. The observed increase just in adult cholesterol level with early cow's milk exposure would in adults be expected to increase cardiovascular disease by 25% and death by 14%. And the estimated impact of cow's milk on later blood pressure was greater than that achieved through lifestyle modification in adult life. So <clears throat> two really important outcomes here for humans, cognitive development and the most major cause of death are really quite strongly related in our own studies to early cow's milk exposure. And there are further programmed effects as well. If you uh, randomly assign babies to cow's milk in the newborn period and they have a positive family history of atopy, then we found that they were programmed for a future risk of food and drug reactions, eczema and wheezing, 
cow's milk exposure uh, is associated with reduced bone mineralization at 20 years follow-up, which uh, could relate to risk of adult degenerative bone disease. And it also adversely affects the development of the heart itself. This was uh, investigated by my colleague, Adam Lewandowski, who did cardiac MRIs at 25 to 28 year follow-up of our preterm randomized trials and found that the exclusively cow's milk fed group in the neonatal period had in adult life, much smaller left and right ventricles, 18% reduction in the size of the right ventricles and smaller stroke volumes, which of course have functional significance for cardiac performance. So I've shown you 15 adverse effects of cow's milk that have been demonstrated in strictly randomized trials, and in some instances, meta-analyses of randomized trials. There are also seven more adverse outcomes that come from cohort data and five proposed indirect adverse effects um, as well that I've demonstrated to you. So the generic mechanisms that might explain this adverse impact of cow's milk could actually be simply the displacement by cow's milk of the benefits of human milk, or it could be direct adverse impacts of cow's milk itself, or possibly the adverse impact of cow's milk fortifiers on human milk biology, or it could be a combination of those. But regardless of mechanism, there is growing evidence that those exposed to cow's milk show broad adverse outcomes. And importantly, this is notable in extremely premature babies. So part of my objective in the first part of my talk was to use good study designs to quantify the adverse impact of cow's milk products. So why would we want to quantify safety here? Well, the first is to test for quality improvement. A modern trend in preterm infant feeding supported by official recommendations is to use donor breast milk if mother's milk is insufficient. Well, this is standard practice. We've done this for 40 to 50 years use mother's own milk uh, and in recent decades added a cow's milk derived fortifier and if there wasn't enough mother's milk we've used a preterm formula um, and what has now emerged as recommended practice is to get rid of the preterm formula and use donor breast milk in western countries and that has resulted in an, a, a human milk based diet most generally fortified with a cow's milk derived fortifier. And the question is whether this emerging practice has actually improved safety. So we did a meta-analysis to test the safety of cow's milk derived fortifier in modern practice, which we recently published. Three studies where the babies had 100% human milk based diet and where it was possible to compare a cow's milk with a human milk derived fortifier. And we found that compared to the human milk derived fortifier group, the ones fed on the cow's milk derived fortifier had a 3.3 fold increased risk of NEC, 2.4 fold increased risk of retinopathy of prematurity, and a 60% increased risk of PDA. Now, a common strategy to increase the power of studies is to combine morbidity outcomes as a mortality morbidity index. And the one we used was the positive index uh, was diagnosed if one or more of the following occurred, death, neck, sepsis, ROP, or BPD. And when we did an analysis of the morbidity index in the three studies, it was 40% higher in the cow's milk derived 45 group. So our meta-analysis showed that cow's milk derived 45 was linked to increases in individual nutrients and also to multiple outcomes embedded in a morbidity index. Well, now we can begin to start looking for differences between standard and current practice. And this is very early stage data, but if we just focus on the right-hand column here, this is looking at the increased relative risk uh, for a disease process in the cow's milk group. So 3.3 fold increased risk uh, of neck, 2.4 fold increased risk of ROP, 60% increased risk of patent ductus. And what you'll notice is crudely that there is very little difference um, between the relative risk for current practice 
and for standard practice. And at this stage, although we have much more work to do, despite 100% human milk-based diet, we found no clear quality improvement. And our data appear to show that the cow's milk derived fortifier may offset the benefits of using donor milk. Another reason why you might want to quantify safety is to address specific issues like, is it really true that there is no benefit of donor milk once it's been pasteurized compared to uh, cow's milk products, which has been claimed by a number of neonatologists? Well, randomized trials are only possible for donor milk or donor breast milk products versus cow's milk. It's unethical to compare mother's milk with cow's milk. So all these 15 outcomes here uh, derived from randomized trials have all been uh, the results of comparing donor breast milk with preterm formula. And uh, you can see that um, the cow's milk groups, as I presented my talk, uh, have had greater morbidity. A third reason why you might want to quant quantify safety is to estimate population morbidity. Now, meta-analyses are often used to calculate relative risk, but we can also use them to estimate population risk based on assuming that the available studies are representative of the population you're studying. Um, since that might not be true, these data are very tentative, but I've presented morbidity in UAE and Saudi um, that's estimated if babies are fed on cow's milk rather than an exclusive human milk diet. So what you're looking at is additional cases that could be potentially attributed to cow's milk and therefore potentially preventable. And you can see 400 cases of necrotizing enterocolitis, which would probably include uh, about 100 deaths, 600 cases uh, of retinopathy of prematurity, which would probably include um, um, 60 cases of, uh, sorry, 30 cases of blindness or uh, severe visual impairment, and 900 cases uh, of, um, of patent ductus arteriosus each year. And uh, of course, you'd like to see these uh, broken down. Obviously, UAE is uh, smaller than Saudi, but this is uh, still an important burden of estimated additional morbidity. And then the additional cases of having a positive morbidity mortality index if uh, fed on cow's milk would be 1,400 cases per year for Saudi and UAE and 200 for UAE. But I do want to emphasize that such population data are approximate, but they'll become more robust as further data is collected, particularly from the Middle East. Now, finally, you might want to quantify safety for health economic studies. Reliable data on the burden of morbidity in each population is key to health economic analyses. And some of these outcomes have been costed and have turned out to be um, expensive. Um, but a lot of these things have not been looked at at all. If we take coronary artery disease, that costs $225 billion a year in the USA. Prematurity is a risk factor, and we should know the impact of cow's milk exposure on this has not been costed yet. So how should we respond clinically to morbidity due to cow's milk? Uh, what are the options? Well, it's been suggested by some that we have no fortification or delayed use of cow's milk or use hydrolyzed fortifiers. And research should continue with these things, but none of these are evidence-based strategies. What we have found is that every stage, historically, when we've compared cow's milk with an exclusive human milk diet, we have seen that deleting cow's milk or deleting preterm formula or both reduces numerous morbidities. So I've taken you on an evidence-based journey, uh, looking at cow's milk with appropriate studies, and cow's milk emerges as a safety issue. In fact, it's one of the more diverse influences on risk of harm that we have in neonatology. Is this new? Not really. By the middle of the 20th century, we had extensive concerns about the safety of cow's milk products for full-term infants. And even today, with the most modern formulas, there are purported advantages um, of breastfeeding um, in these respects compared to formula feeding. And that's, of course, why we promote 
breastfeeding. So against that background, my first message is that cow's milk derived products are generally recognized to have adverse effects. What is new about what I presented is that it's the extremely preterm infant that appears least adaptable to cow's milk with a really major burden of morbidity. Secondly, so far we've not demonstrated any evidence that the modern diet providing all human milk with a cow's milk derived fortifier has improved safety. The third uh, point is that whether we look in the past or the present, the evidence suggests that excluding cow's milk is linked with less morbidity versus a diet including cow's milk. So my final message is this, cow's milk products are of immense value in neonatal intensive care and we would never have been able to manage nutrition effectively uh, without them. But for extremely preterm infants, the use of cow's milk needs rethinking. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Lucas, for a great presentation as usual and a great uh, end of the day for presentation. We have uh, a lot of questions and I hope that you have enough time to answer all the questions. Um, uh, welcome back everybody uh, from the old presentations for last session. Uh, we're gonna start with some of the questions. Some of these uh, questions are addressed actually by the speakers from last uh, day, yesterday presentation. But I will just ask them as they come from our participants. Uh, first question is uh, for uh, Professor Poland. Uh, what's your thoughts about hospital uniform and risk of sepsis, uh, where the staff use uh, hospital uniform versus scrub versus normal clothes for uh, an incident of sepsis in an ICU? So thanks for the question. Um, Elaine Larson, who works at Columbia, she's actually works in the School of Nursing, has done an estimate of the risk of transmission of um, bacteria through using clothing. And the risk is about one in 10,000. So we do not use an, um, a specific outfit. Some of our faculty and nurses wear um, scrubs, which is typical for most NICUs, but the risk of transmitting bacteria is very low through clothing and hand hygiene is clearly the most important way of preventing infection. So no, we don't use uniforms, but scrubs are used commonly uh, in our NICU. Very good. Uh, another question for Dr. Poland is, what's the role of the tip culture when you remove central line to evaluate for sepsis uh, with the So great question, we don't do it. Uh, tip cultures often re represent lying colonization. So uh, they may be positive, um, but we, uh, if the baby is looking well, we just take the line out and do not obtain a culture from the tip of the catheter. Okay, very good. Dr. Eric, a uh, question for the algorithm that you follow at CHOP. Uh, see, there's two questions. One about uh, if the baby is preterm delivered by cesarean section without labor and the child develops uh, respiratory distress needing respiratory support, but hemodynamically stable, would that baby start on antibiotic or instability will go on to? Yeah, so. Um... Dr. Amy, you froze there for a minute, but but I think I understand the question. So so um, it would be left to the severity of illness, and I think that that the important thing to remember is that 
um, respiratory symptoms are very common in these small babies. And so we would, in the setting of a baby who had no other birth risk factors for early onset sepsis, who had a clinical course consistent with respiratory distress syndrome without cardiovascular instability, we would recommend not starting antibiotics, but that really depends on the severity of, of the baby's illness. And so if the baby were really critically ill in that situation, um, I think many of our neonatologists would opt to go ahead and start. Uh, we monitor um, the proportion of babies who are started on antibiotics who we consider to be low risk. And in our um, NICUs, it's about 20%. So there is some neonatology discretion, but we try to recommend that the majority of them not be treated. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Janine, have questions? Yeah, uh, I have a few questions. Uh, first question is uh, for Dr. Alan Lucas, that uh, in Middle East, I still, uh, because of the sociocultural reason, we don't have the donor milk. So uh, how long you should wait for a very uh, preterm baby to start with the formula when the uh, initially breast milk is not available is 24 hours. Uh, the question is that, that the empty gut is more dangerous or the formula is the more dangerous? I think that's actually a very, it's a very good question and it needs to be evaluated properly. Uh, well, I can answer it qualitatively in the sense that the, the longer you delay, um, the less cow's milk related morbidities you're likely to see, but you'll see other problems instead. Um, obviously the babies won't grow as well, uh, which is important for neurodevelopment. And uh, you'll have more parenteral nutrition or both. And a greater parenteral nutrition has important risks as I think I've um, demonstrated in my, in my talk today. So um, it, I think probably on balance, um, one should go for growth because um, probably the most irreversible thing uh, would be an Im any impairment in neurodevelopment. So I, I would favor feeding babies well and accept that there's going to be morbidity, but it is a preventable morbidity. Um, and um, hopefully that will be achieved in the future. Okay. Uh, there's a one uh, question for Dr. Eric. Uh, mostly what happened that the, there's a kind of a anxiety culture to start the antibiotic, for example, uh, how you differentiate in a 26, 27, 28 weeker that it is purely the RDS or it is a uh, pneumonia also. So that's why, and then when the baby is fine, everybody is afraid. How to overcome that thing the, to stop the antibiotic right away, like up till 36 hours or 48 hours. And most of the time they end up in five, seven days antibiotic course. Uh, just to re-emphasize on that, I, I know in your talk, you uh, talk about that. Yeah, no, that's a very good question. And I think that, that um, I think any type of, of change in practice is, complicated. And I think that what you need is buy-in from the neonatologists that, that this is how they're going to approach um, the judicious use of antibiotics in the unit. And I think that that in a, in a circumstance where a baby is critically ill, hypotensive on pressors, um, needing significant ventilatory support, I think that if if you elect to continue those antibiotics for seven days, I don't think anybody would fault you in the setting of a negative culture. But I think what we need to evolve into is to recognize that, that antibiotics do have risks associated with them. And we should be sure that the benefits outweigh the risks. And, and, and so in babies who um, are not significantly critically ill, um, even if they had risk factors for sepsis, if their cultures are negative, um, serious consideration should be given to stopping the antibiotics. And I think that, that you're right, um, uh, Dr. Nade, that, that we're nervous. And as I presented in my case, we're nervous and saying it's not gonna cause any harm and we wanna do what's best for the baby. But, sure. but um, we're, I think we're learning much more that 
that um, that the prolonged use of antibiotics isn't harmless, and so we should have a good, strong indication for using them for that for that purpose. Thank you. Back to you, Eamon. Yeah, uh, there's a, along the same line, Dr. Eric, uh, we have a, one question about the value of TRP, C-reactive protein, uh, in the sepsis evaluation. What to do if the TRP is high and the culture is negative? And the same, uh, another question is about uh, if the baby is sick, but the blood culture is negative, should we stop the antibiotic? So I'm going to defer the CRP question to my esteemed colleague, Dr. Poland, who has published a lot of information on that. Um, I, I will tell you that in my clinical practice, I do not um, draw CRPs because I think that they don't have any particular value. I'm certainly not as a single value, but may have some value in helping us discontinue antibiotics um, if, if the CRP is dropping rather than rising. But I'll I'll let Dr. Poland um, uh, give his opinion and answer since he's much more of an expert on that than I am. But, but I, I think that the second question, uh, again, I think it goes back to um, what's your threshold of what constitutes really critical illness? And I, and, and I think that, that um, just still being on a ventilator and requiring some oxygen as a 24 weeker um, doesn't mean that they're infected. And I think if you have um, ancillary evidence that there's no infection uh, and your blood cultures are negative, um, then um, stopping antibiotics early is, is wise because the risks may outweigh the benefits. And so I'll turn it over to Dr. Poland about the CRP. Thanks, Eric. I'm not sure I'm an expert on CRP. When I was much younger, I used to say CRPs were important in identifying babies with sepsis. And we know that is not true. Uh, C-reactive protein, Procalcitonin, neither have shown to have a good positive predictive accuracy. Um, as you mentioned, it may reassure you in not starting antibiotics if the CRP is low, that you're not dealing with an infectious episode. If it's high, it does not help you very much. So I draw many fewer CRPs than I used to draw 10 years ago. And only, I guess it only helps me if it's low and I decide not to treat a specific baby. But I don't think they're of much value anymore. Overused, underrated. And we agree, I think, on what you said. Okay, very good. Uh, uh, there's another question about uh, uh, the management of babies uh, with sepsis for Professor Poland. If the presence of negative bl peripheral blood culture uh, the central line is ignored, then why do it at all? A great question. It's exactly my point. We have stopped drawing central line blood cultures. When possible, we try two peripheral blood cultures. Not always possible. I agree with Eric. One ml ought to be the minimal volume, if possible, that you draw for a blood culture. But uh, we don't draw central line blood cultures uh, anymore, unless we're, it's the only possible way of getting a blood culture, but it's usually not. We can usually get a peripheral vein blood culture, even in the tiniest baby. So try not to do it. It's not very helpful. Very good. There's a question about, uh, for Dr. Eric, about the use of probiotics to prevent dysbiosis uh, during using antibiotics. The same line, there's a question about fluconazole use during the uh, use of antibiotics to prevent uh, fungal, future fungal infection? Yeah, I think that, um, that those are both very good questions. I think that the issue of probiotics, I know that there are some centers that if a baby's on prolonged antibiotics will prescribe a probiotic or probiotics will be used um, prophylactically. Um, in the United States, um, that is probably, they're probably less NICUs using probiotics than, than um, um, not using them. And I think it really is because there hasn't been a global recommendation around the use of probiotics, particularly because in the United States, at least, a pharmaceutical grade product is not available. And there have been at least a couple of case reports of babies developing um, unusual infections um, um, traced back to the probiotics since they're not um, um, uh, controlled by the United States FDA. Um, 
the second question about fluconazole is also a very good one. I, I think that that um, we do in certain circumstances, if we're using broad spectrum antibiotics for an, a documented infection, or for example, for necrotizing enterocolitis, um, many of our clinicians will prescribe fluconazole as a prophylaxis against fungal sepsis. And, and I think that that's based on the evidence that the incidence of uh, fungal infection is um, associated with the use of prolonged broad spectrum antibiotics. And so that I think would be a reasonable decision uh, in, a, in, in a very preterm baby when you know that you're going to treat for a prolonged period of time for a documented infection. I, I would hate to recommend, well, if you're gonna treat for clinical sepsis for 14 days with ceftazidine, give fluconazole you should be having second thoughts about treating for 14 days with ceftazidine in the setting of negative blood cultures. But, but I think that, that that's a, that's a an excellent point and one that, that um, is a reasonable practice in my opinion. So, I mean, I just want to make a, a, a sort of a corollary to what Eric has just said. Uh, we just yesterday uh, decided not to use fluconazole when we're using broad spectrum antibiotics because our risk of fungal sepsis is so low in our NICU, we just barely see any. And I guess if you're in a NICU where fungal sepsis is a problem, I could see using fluconazole um, prophylaxis, which was effective in the large randomized clinical trial. But if you're in a unit where you don't see fungal sepsis, uh, I would say probably it's not indicated. Uh, this is unique. Yeah, uh, I have a couple of questions for Dr. Lucas. Uh, uh, Dr. Allen, uh, if uh, the baby is like a very premature 24, 26 weeker, and uh, now there is a new product in the market and they are coming here also, and the breast milk is not available. So the effect of the that product, which is a donor breast milk, uh, and they reconstituted, the, came with the name of product, how you, how you compare it with the breast milk and with the formula milk? Is there any, uh, uh, you know, the stratification that breast milk is the best than this product and then cow milk uh, if we don't have the breast milk? Well, I think that um, there's a great difference between uh, human milk derived products and human milk, i.e. in the milk or um, mother's own milk. Obviously, um, uh, in the UAE, the, the principal um, use would be of mother's milk. Um, but the, the, the difference is that um, the human milk-based products are nutritionally suitable for um, uh, preterm infants. So you avoid giving cow's milk-derived fortifiers. And you've seen the data I presented today showing that cow's milk-derived fortifiers, um, which were sort of thought to be just a little sprinkling of something in breast milk, actually is a lot of uh, cow's milk protein and has a, a range of adverse effects. But there's another point as well, and that is if you're going to sort of rank mother's milk versus, let's say, um, human milk derived um, products um, with each other from the point of view of um, um, preventing necrotizing enterocolitis, sepsis, feed intolerance and so forth. Actually, for most outcomes, um, there really isn't a difference. And uh, we, um, I mean, the, the, the big difference is whether you have cow's milk products or not, but the difference between human milk um, uh, that's mother's own and, uh, uh, and donor milk or donor milk products is actually very small. I and mean, we've done quite a detailed analysis on this. Pasteurization is relatively kind to breast milk. I mean, it destroys um, uh, some things, but other things are... Uh, heat stable. And anyway, the important thing is clinical outcome. Uh, I mean, we've done one study, um, which uh, is awaiting publication, uh, where we've demonstrated that uh, in a cohort where we have every grade of um, a, a percentage from 0% uh, mother's milk and all uh, donor milk to 100% um, um, donor milk. And um, we, we've not been able to detect across that gradient any differences between the two types of milk on neck, sepsis, and feed intolerance. Um, the, there is some uh, work of ours that 
um, possibly suggested that donor breast milk wasn't as good for the brain as um, mother's milk, but we, we're coming to the view that that's just because of the nutritional content difference and that uh, when human milk is used in a, um, uh, as human milk products that actually um, um, fortify the milk, it's the other way around. There's a very good neurodevelopment. So um, I don't know if that answers that question yeah. for you. Okay, thanks. Uh, the the question to uh, Professor Lucas. Yeah. Uh, same line. Uh, there's some uh, units, uh, um, they, uh, in attempt to give only breast milk and not force the babies to formula, they keep the baby's initial days on mm -hmm. IV fluid until the mother uh, milk becomes available. What's mm -hmm. your recommendation regarding how long should we wait for well, the mother milk to come before uh, we give the baby's milk? Yeah, I mean, I, I think... Um, I mean, in certain situations, um, certain very high risk situations, um, um, uh, having um, no cow's milk in the diet um, uh, would reduce um, uh, very serious um, morbidity. But as I pointed out before, the, the problem is meeting nutritional need. And I mean, uh, parental nutrition uh, has a number of problems, um, including uh, having a central line in for longer with um, with sepsis and so forth, just since uh, sepsis is a theme of this section. Um, so uh, that that is a risk, and also um, it's very difficult to achieve good growth um, without um, uh, w without enteral feeds that are nutrient enriched. So it's a compromise. You would be um, sacrificing some things and gaining others uh, if you do it. I mean, the ideal situation obviously um, is uh, not to have to do, not to have to do that. But um, I, I, I can see that in certain situations um, that would be uh, a compromise. Very good. Uh, question for Dr. I, I think that very few people practice that. Yes, okay. exactly. Uh, should we remove the central line in case of positive blood culture in preterm ventilated babies? So it depends on the organism you recover. If the, if the positive organism is a low virulence organism like coagulase negative staphylococcus, treating the line, treating with antibiotics through the indwelling line seems perfectly acceptable to me. If culture is don't clear, for example, in 48 to 72 hours, I would remove the line. If it's fungus, remove the line immediately. If it's gram pot, if it's Staphylococcus aureus, um, and the line is essential for the baby's well-being, treating through the line is okay. Again, if it's gram negative, we try to remove the line and treat um, with antibiotics through our peripheral IV line. Uh, we have a lot of questions about uh, the context of uh, uh, chorioaminitis, babies born in a situation with aminitis. We heard from you, Professor Bowen, yesterday that uh, you recommend observation. Uh, we have the algorithm from CHOP that recommends treatment. So we need a final word on this so we don't have uh, confusion. So I'll, I'll stop. Eric and I probably agree pretty much on this. If it's a preterm baby with chorioaminitis, and that's assuming the obstetrician was correct in making that diagnosis, most of the time, I think around the country, uh, certainly in New York, I'm guessing in Philadelphia, you would treat that, we would treat that baby. If it's a late preterm or term baby who appears well, then I think the idea of withholding antibiotics, even if the mother has an intraamniotic infection or core amniotis is a reasonable approach. And that's how we would do it. But Eric, uh, why don't you tell us what you would do? Yeah, no, I, I agree, Rich. I think that, that my graphic really had to do with extremely preterm babies. And I think if you're born at less than a kilo and your mother has core amniotis, I think most um, neonatologists would recommend um, at least a rule out for infection, given that the risk is, is significant in that situation, particularly with a gestational age less than 28 weeks. 
Um, I think if you're a late preterm or term, then the risk is substantially lower. And I think that that's where um, in many settings, um, observation is fine. And I think that, that, Rich, I think you're referring to the studies out of Stanford where they just did serial physical exams and, and were able to withhold antibiotics from, from a, a lot of term babies. Um, um, and I think that, that as the Coffin statement says, that's maybe a reasonable approach if you have the capability of doing serial physical exams in a rooming in situation with a mother, which may, well, may be difficult. Um, but I think that use of the sepsis calculator, um, which, which I, I guess I would caution has not been validated in a setting outside of the United States. I think there has been some validation in England, but I think that, that, I, the, the, it's important to note that the sepsis calculator does um, require you to have a knowledge of what your sepsis rate actually is, and you can set that within the calculator. So I think that that's important to, to note, but I think that, that serial observations of a well late preterm term baby um, is certainly a, um, uh, an alternative to universal use of, of antibiotics. Um, so I think that, again, there's been a, a shift to using less antibiotics in that setting um, over the, certainly in the course of my career, that, that, um, that we try to avoid um, um, antibiotics simply because of chorioaminitis in, in the uh, later gestational age babies. Uh, Amen. Very good. Uh, and last question for Dr. Junaid. Yeah, I, uh, Dr. Poland, you said that you are not doing the, uh, uh, what you call the uh, central line uh, culture or the culture from the central line. But the CDC guidelines or something, uh, our quality people, our infection control people, uh, they have that guideline that it is a collapsy when you have a culture positive from the central line and a peripheral culture positive. So how to deal with that situation? Uh, yeah, I guess two answers. If the baby's critically ill, you, you look at the culture as you're going to treat that baby anyway. If the baby's not critically ill, and it's sometimes hard to tell an infectious disease from just a clinical deterioration without an infectious etiology, we would ignore a positive culture from a central line for coagulase negative staphylococcus. If it was staph aureus, or if it was E. coli, Klebsiella, uh, we would not ignore it. So it depends on the pathogen, depends on the degree of illness. But in general, we're not doing these central line blood cultures. And I, I guess I would disagree with the thought of obtaining them on a routine basis. So, so I, th I think question is that when you level, it is Klebsi. When the two cultures are positive, uh, but it, if you have two crippled blood cultures, both the same organism, clearly it's a clapsy. Okay. When it's uh, just a central line blood culture positive for a commensal, like coagulase negative staphylococcus, we would call that line colonization or contamination. If it's another pathogen, we would be worried that it is a true clapsy. Uh, over to you, Eamon. Sorry? Yes, I'm just the questions that you read. <laughs> okay, yes, okay. You can, over to you. So uh, we're, uh, we're uh, actually closing right now because uh, we are just a little bit over time. So I would like really to thank everybody, uh, 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 all the presenters for their really great uh, presentations. Uh, I know that everybody benefited from a tremendous wealth of knowledge that everybody shared with us. And I'm sure that uh, we're going to have a lot of questions, so maybe we will direct them to you when we have them. Uh, great presentation today. Uh, um, I think uh, uh, everybody benefited from this, and I would really like to thank uh, the presenters. And uh, we're going to have another day of uh, great presentations tomorrow. So I will uh, give it back uh, to our MC for a, some final remarks, and then we will close it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.
again, thank you all the participants and all the speakers. Uh, uh, thank you, my friend and my colleague, uh, Eamon. Tomorrow we have another day with the very exciting uh, sessions on cardiology and endocrinology. So I hope to see you all there. Uh, so once again, thank you very much. That's all I have to say. And uh, Vincent, over to you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Khan. And thank you to our amazing speakers today. It's been an amazing session and lots of uh, uh, great topics discussed today. So uh, it's the most exciting part of the day where we would announce the winner of the smartwatch. So before that, uh, just to let you know, we had an average of uh, 800 delegates online who attended the program today and a total of 1,200 registrations. So that's a whopping 1,200 people and almost 800 uh, participants with us today. So uh, it gives me great pleasure to announce the winner of the smartwatch. So this person has been online with us, interacting with us and uh, chatting with the uh, speakers as well as the sponsors and uh, stayed with us for uh, throughout the day. And the lucky winner for the smartwatch is Soumya Joyce George from Medina Zaid Hospital in Abu Dhabi. So congratulations to Soumya Joyce George, the lucky winner of the smartwatch. And she's from the Medina Zaid Hospital right here in Abu Dhabi. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. <clears throat> and we would uh, like to see you tomorrow and uh, fresh uh, tomorrow. Thank you for spending your time with us. And we will continue with our conference tomorrow with great sessions uh, from we're talking about uh, quality improvement and the chronology as well as, uh, well as cardiology. So we see you tomorrow and our program will start tomorrow at uh, 1320. So have a great evening and take care. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks a lot.